All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome and uh, good evening uh, and happy new year to everybody. Uh, my name is Eric Gonzalez Alfaro and my pronouns are he, him, él, and I'm the legislative director for the ACLU of Washington. I'm speaking from the traditional homelands of the first peoples of Seattle, the Coast Salish peoples who have stewarded this land since time immemorial. Our office uh, downtown uh, sits on the unceded territory of the Duwamish peoples. We must always remember the role of our, our country uh, and how they played in stripping them of their lands, culture, and languages, and recognize the ways in which we perpetuate colonization today. We acknowledge uh, the land acknowledgments like these are just the beginning. We recognize that there is so much more work to be done uh, in this country to truly make it fair and just. I encourage you to learn about uh, the land you are on. See link in the chat to find out more. Um, I also want to share a powerful animation on the scale and, and severity of land loss. Uh, check out the a link in the chat. First, I have a, a couple orders of business. Um, our flights and rights uh, events are typically hosted in breweries and event spaces uh, around the state, most often. Uh, the gathering space of KXP 90.3 FM in Seattle, kxp.org everywhere else in the world. And uh, KXP has been an important partner over the years. So thank you to KXP. Even though we're, we aren't together in person, we have flights to go with our rights. Please stop by uh, these places this week for $5 off your order uh, un until our tab runs out. Specific dates are in the chat and on our website, Boots Bakery in Spokane, Cafe Vita at KXP uh, Gathering Space, Union Coffee and Wine in Seattle Central District, Bell Breaker Brewery and Yonder Cider Tap Room in Ballard. Again, the, the details are in the chat box and on our website. Everyone in attendance tonight has been entered in an ACLU of Washington Supreme Swag Giveaway. Our prize package includes swag by Indigenous artist Emma Noyes and a set of KXP and ACLU koozies to keep your hands warm and your drink cold. You cannot get any of these anywhere else. We'll draw names after the event and notify three lucky winners by email in the coming week. Okay, so back at it. Uh, tonight, we'll discuss what occurred during our most recent Washington State Legislative Session. The Legislative Session began January 10th and ended on March 10th. It was an even year Legislative Session most commonly referred to as a short 60 day Supplemental Budget Year Session or short session. Short sessions are typically years where new legislation is more difficult to pass, if not socialized adequately, if the policy proposal isn't immediate, and if they pose a challenge politically. The session this year included a number of these challenges, including but not limited to the following. Everyone in the House of Representatives is up for re-election, uh, and in some cases this can cause a number uh, of members to have extra caution weighing politics over policy to a greater degree when deciding what to prioritize and what to vote for. The federal midterm election, historically we've seen the political pendulum swing in the opposite direction of the party that is in power. And three, uh, this is a second ever virtual session. This meant that all our lobbying, member engagement and interactions with elected officials and staff was done virtually. This is not normal. Um, while it does allow for people to engage with their elected officials with greater ease, especially those that do not have the opportunity to drive short or long distances or to take time uh, to head to Olympia for two minutes worth of testimony or short but meaningful meetings with their elected officials, it doesn't impact the way that advocates and lobbyists, lobbyists do their work. As a lobbyist, our work is to get um, our issues before the elected members. Our role essentially is to be effectively annoying or annoying but effective. Remote, uh, the remote session meant that we couldn't catch them on the way out of a committee hearing room uh, to bend their ear about something that is important to us, uh, to pull them off the floor for a quick chat. But that this also meant that you know the rumor mill uh, that lobbyists can hear can't be casually whispered um, to each other in passing. Everything about the virtual session is a bit more formal, more structured, but at times it can, can seem very disconnected. So the virtual, um, as with last year, was a test for leadership, relationships, trust, and integrity of individuals, which is our world um, you know, of lobbying. You know, that's everything. 
So tonight we'll hear, um, we'll discuss high profile issues related to data privacy, automated decision systems, healthcare and reproductive rights, policing and public safety. Uh, we'll be breaking these issues up into three 15 minute conversation vignettes with the ACLU policy leads who are joined by representatives from several organizational partners that have expertise and firsthand understanding of the policies and political challenges that we face during the 2022 legislative session. And to be quite frank, who did most of the heavy lifting? Jen Lee, Privacy Tech and Liberty Council will be joined by Brianna Elfrey, uh, the legal counsel at the Washington State Chapter of the Council on American Islamic, uh, Council on Islamic American Relations. Leah Rutman, uh, she's our Healthcare and Liberty Council, will be joined by Yvette Magagna, Washington State Government Relations Manager for Plant Parenthood Alliance Advocates. And Inoka Herat, Immigration and Policing Council, will be joined by Katrina Johnson, Family Member Representative of the Washington Coalition for Police Accountability. After these three segments, we'll have 15 minutes for questions from the public uh, on the issues featured today or on other issues that folks have questions about. So with that said, we'll bring on the first panel. Let's welcome Leah and Yvette Magagna to discuss the issues of healthcare access and reproductive rights. Welcome Leah, welcome Yvette. So I'll start off with the first question. A big priority for a number of organizations this year included the Keep Our Care Act and Affirm Abortion in Washington. These two bills were big priorities for our organizations this, this session. Can you please describe how these strategies came together and what they mean in operation? Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Eric. Um, I would say that, you know, Washington is one of the most progressive states when it comes to sexual and reproductive health and rights. Uh, so these bills made straightforward changes to our laws that have significant impacts on improving access to abortion and continuing our proud history of leadership for abortion rights. Um, and here in Washington, we believe that everyone deserves the freedom to make their own decision about their bodies and their lives, including the decision to have an abortion. Um, unfortunately, we are in a crisis moment for abortion access across the country, um, but that's not the case here in Washington because of the proactive legislation like we'll be discussing today. Um, our mission is to increase access to health care, and that is exactly what uh, House Bill 1851, the Affirm Washington Abortion Access Act, is doing uh, by ensuring people have access to reproductive health care, that there is a hospital or health care facility in their community that will provide them with the care they need and an adequate network of health care providers across the state. Um, I'll pause there and pass it to Leah. Thanks so much, Yvette and Eric. You know, um, I think Yvette really laid out what we're seeing right now. Um, in regards specifically to the Keep Our Care Act, Eric mentioned, for many years in our state and across the country, we have seen health system consolidations occur at a rapid rate. Um, studies and real world experience show us that consolidations increase prices, decrease quality of care, and decrease access to care, including reproductive health care. Um, the Keep Our Care Act initially formed because advocates were emboldened to act when Virginia Mason announced that it was affiliating with CHI Franciscan. When that consolidation went through, it resulted in restrictions placed on abortion care, on medical aid and dying, similar to what we've seen over and over again in this state. Since then, advocates have been working tirelessly to try to pass legislation to protect communities. Uh, the Keep Our Care Act would create a system of enforcement and oversight so that um, consolidations would improve rather than harm communities' access to care. Can you uh, describe some of the challenges of getting these uh, bills through the legislative process? 
Yeah, I can uh, kick it off. I mean, as I've mentioned, um, we are at a crisis point when it comes to abortion access across the country. Um, and I'll I'll go big and then bring it local. Um, you know, the majority of Americans don't believe that Roe is really going to be overturned. Um, we're trying to convey the urgency of this moment, but we're fighting an uphill battle because many people don't realize just how urgent it is. Um, Anti-abortion bills are rapidly moving through legislatures all across the country. Even here in Washington, there were a few anti-abortion bills introduced uh, while we continue to see the ramifications of Texas's um, SB8 and other states coming out with copycat legislation. Um, for example, just yesterday, the Idaho State Legislature passed Senate Bill 1309, which was a six week abortion ban um, styled after Texas law. And in Mississippi, there is the 15 weeks Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization case that the Supreme Court uh, is expected to decide as soon as this June, um, which we expect will overturn or uh, override Roe entirely. Particularly here in Washington with the Affirm Washington Abortion Access Act, we have a really enthusiastic legislative majority currently, and we are so grateful. Nonetheless, um, as we've seen, opponents can take some really low blows and the strategy just has to be really carefully planned. Um, and because of that, we all must um, just continue to fight uh, forward and helping people understand that the threat is real. And I just add, I think Yvette did such a great job talking about you know, what's happening in the country right now. Um, to get into some specifics about the Keep Our Care Act, I don't want to sugarcoat things. Our primary challenge were the hospitals, right? Because they don't like the restrictions and requirements being put on them. With that said, all bills are going to experience a variety of challenges. The Keep Our Care Act didn't pass this year, and I'm sure we'll experience old and new challenges as we move it forward and eventually pass it in the years to come. That's right. Thank you both. Um, what are other important pieces of legislation uh, that you think uh, folks should know about that passed in uh, 2022? That is a great question. There was um, a package of health care bills that are uh, state legislature passed. Uh, one that comes to the top for me is House Bill uh, 1881, which is uh, which was led by Surge Reproductive Justice with their doulas for all campaign. Um, and what this does is it, it establishes birth doulas as a profession by creating voluntary competency-based uh, state certification pathway. Um, so what this bill will do, it'll increase access to birth doulas in Washington state, um, and it, it will also center black maternal um, health equity. A couple others that uh, flow to the top for me, there was um, Senate Bill 5765, which expands the scope of practice uh, to allow for prescriptive authority for midwives. Um, there was uh, House Bill 1651, which allows providers to bill separately uh, for immediate postpartum LARC, which is long acting reversible contraception, such as IUDs, Nexplanon, um, and others. And then the last one that's coming to mind right now is Senate Bill 5072 for health plan coverage for donor breast milk. I'm so glad that you mentioned all those incredibly important bills. Um, I would just add and want to highlight one other healthcare issue. We saw a lot of progress on the session. Um, the Health Equity for Immigrants campaign, which is a group of over 100 organizations made up of community leaders, advocates, and health providers, have been advocating for equitable health coverage. This is so essential because Washington is home to an estimated 105,000 uninsured immigrants who are obviously integral members of our communities, but who aren't eligible for Medicaid or qualified health plans solely because of their immigration status. It's completely inequitable. 
Um, but I'm really happy to report out that this year, the budget allocated $12.1 million to launch healthcare programs for all Washingtonians, regardless of immigration status. There is still a ton of work to do to make this a reality by 2024, but it's a really big step forward. Yeah, that's tremendous work. Um, so Yvette, you sort of mentioned this in your, in your remarks, but how do we expect the legislation to increase economic security and reprodu reproductive freedom? Um, what are the disparities that we've seen when people are trying to access services and how do they differ based on geographic location or because of the racial or ethnic backgrounds? Yeah, I would say anytime we see a crackdown of abortion rights, like we saw yes, like we saw past yesterday in Idaho, we know that it will harm Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, people with low incomes, and those living in rural areas the most. Um, you know, people struggling to make ends meet are often forced to delay accessing abortion services because they need the time to secure the funds, to take time off from work, to arrange childcare if needed, um, and often travel to get the care that they need. Um, so that's why uh, legislation like the Affirm Washington Abortion Access Act uh, is so important because it will increase the pool of qualified people who are able to provide care. Um, it will help lower waiting times at clinics, bringing care um, and hopefully closer for those uh, facing systemic barriers. Um, and it will also help with improving access for all. Um, and I'm particularly looking at it through a racial justice and gender equity lens. Um, I would also add something that Planned Parenthood Alliance Advocates is dealing with uh, specifically is that people in Idaho are going to have to leave their state now that um, there is no more abortion access. And so our closest clinic uh, that borders would be the Kennewick Planned Parenthood, um, which is now considered a near option for abortion patients in Boise, even though it's more than a four hour drive. So horrible when you go through the parade of everything that is occurring right now. Um, for the Keep Our Care Act, I would just add um, consolidations can exasperate systemic inequities and large health systems don't always have the community's best interests at heart. Uh, Washington's two largest health systems have over $33.5 billion in reserves, yet the Attorney General keeps having to sue health systems in our state for not providing charity care to low-income patients. It's unacceptable and prevents patients from getting the care they need. The Keep Our Care Act was drafted to address these disparities. It includes a health equity assessment to ensure marginalized communities' needs are accounted for, and it would disallow any of these mergers to move forward if it would decrease community access to, and I emphasize, affordable care. That's pretty impressive work. Um, so I got a two-parter. Um, what are any, uh, are there any specific issues that we should expect to impact our state as the future of Roe v. Wade is uncertain and other states like Idaho um, are severely limiting abortion access? And what can people do to adv advance and lift up the need for further action on these type of issues? Let me, I'll take the first question first. Um, I mean, in a, we are in a country where black women are three times more likely than white women to die from largely preventable pregnancy related complications due to racism and discrimination in care, forcing pregnant people to carry the term against their will, putting their lives at risk. Um, just to kind of illustrate the impact of this, it's estimated that 400,000 people of reproductive age in Idaho will be left without access uh, to abortion. So patients will need to drive out of state um, an average of 250 miles uh, to access that abortion care, which is you know, unrealistic, unfeasible, just for too many Idahoans. Um, and it this, this law that they just passed will disproportionately harm um, BIPOC communities, Black, Indigenous, Latino, um, LGBTQ communities, and people of color um, when that um, implementation um, 
of the abortion ban goes into effect and it is officially unavailable. So because of this, people will have to put together resources to travel out of state, find childcare, take time off of work on top of, again, finding an out of state provider, finding a place to stay and, um, um, and funding to pay for care and a large portion of those patients coming in from states like Idaho and surrounding states that are just um, li limiting this access, they will be traveling here to Washington State. And plus one to all of that, and I'll just take the next question, um, what can people do? So I think I can think offhand of sort of three things that can have a really big meaningful impact. Um, Number one, donate to abortion funds like the Northwest Abortion Access Fund. These funds ensure vulnerable pregnant people have the funds to access the need, access their care they need. It is absolutely essential. Um, really can't highlight that enough. Um, with the current environment, they will just be key to people getting care. Number two, make sure people understand that even if Roe versus Wade is overturned, the right to an abortion still exists in Washington state, the right to choose an abortion. There is a lot of confusion right now and patients need to know they can still get the care they need here. And number three, please, please let lawmakers know that you care about these issues. What you communicate to your lawmaker has a real impact, often more than us saying these things, they're used to hearing from us. They care about the, what their constituents want and we will need as much help as possible to ensure Washington can provide reproductive health care access to Washingtonians, but also to the many patients who will likely be coming to our state soon. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, you two, for your incredible work this session and for all the past work you've done. And we look forward to working on the you know, next steps together. So thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. All right, so next up, we'll bring up our uh, panel of Jen Lee and Brianna Frey to discuss issues of surveillance, data, and automated decision systems from this session. Welcome. Hi, Eric. Hi, Eric. All right, so let's start off with data privacy. Uh, this is the fourth year in a row uh, that the legislature has tried to address the issue of data privacy. Do you think that this is an issue that has fully been debated to death or are there other strategies, policies, either in the US or abroad that the legislature could take inspiration from? Um, I'll start. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Um, while this is indeed the fourth year in a row that uh, the Washington State Legislature has tried to pass data privacy legislation, the public and legislators have only really been able to consider one type of data privacy legislation, and that is largely legislation that maintains an exploitative status quo. And by that, I mean legislation that continues to allow companies to collect, use, and share our data without our permission. This kind of invasive data collection has serious implications for all of us, but especially for communities and individuals who are elderly, who are poor, and uh, individuals and communities who are disproportionately targeted by police. And the lack of strong data privacy protections um, that we have currently has allowed LGBTQ dating apps to share users' HIV status with their parties, for the US military to buy the location data of users of Muslim prayer apps, for protesters to be surveilled with facial recognition technology, and um, for migrant children and families to be arrested and deported. And it's for these very serious reasons um, that in the past four years, we and um, the Tech Equity Coalition have been working really hard to oppose industry-backed data privacy bills that would continue to allow companies to collect, use, and share people's information without our consent. The bill that we defeated this year, it would have allowed entities to collect our information without consent, track and profile people, share people's data with affiliated companies, warrantlessly share our information with law enforcement and would have prohibited local jurisdictions in Washington from passing any stronger privacy laws. Um, in addition to opposing these bad bills, last year in the 2021 session, we worked with Rep Clova to introduce HB 1433 or the People's Privacy Act. And this is a bill that would require companies to actually get permission before using our data it would allow people to hold companies accountable if they violate our rights. And it's a bill that doesn't contain the litany of loopholes and exemptions that are 
present in so many of the other bills that we've seen. Um, unfortunately, the People's Privacy Act didn't get a hearing last session or this session, which really limits um, the legislature's ability to actually hear people talk about these bills and to debate between two very different approaches to privacy and consider some of the strong opt-in approaches that we've seen um, considered in places like New York and Massachusetts, as well as, of course, in Europe with the GDPR, which requires freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous opt-in consent. Um, so to summarize and answer your question, I don't think this issue has been fully debated, and it's really time for the legislature to consider adopting an approach that will truly protect people's privacy and their rights. I don't know how much more I could say than that, but uh, you you covered that really, really well, Jen. I would just say that, you know, this year in many ways did feel like a, a bit of a repetition of some of the, the same issues that we keep coming back to, like Jen said, affirmative opt-in consent. The fact that that we can't even gain any traction or consensus on this, this fundamental issue in data privacy policy is, is proof that one, there are tremendous forces uh, from tech that are are pushing alternative narratives that there is the possibility for protection without such a mechanism, uh, which we pretty firmly disagree with. And uh, it also just confirms that that I think there's still a lot of misunderstanding about what's being done with data, what the the potential consequences of data abuse can be. Otherwise, you know, if if our lawmakers were fully comprehending this issue, we wouldn't still be be in disagreement about something so fundamental to this protection. Thank you both. Um, I'm going to go to the next question. Uh, so Shana Zuboff, the author of the book, Age of Surveillance Capitalism, stated, we are the sources of surveillance capitalism's crucial surplus, the objects of a technolo technologically advanced and increasingly raw material extraction operation. Surveillance capitalism's actual customers are the enterprise that trade in markets for future behavior. The question is, do you agree with this statement and what can be done to prevent our information from being sold, traded, shared, or otherwise used without our knowledge or consent? I think it's a little bit of a complicated way to put it, um, but I do agree with the statement. I think essentially it comes down to the fact that there is incentive for companies to understand what trends there are in our behaviors in order to predict future behaviors and then also manipulate those behaviors. And so I do think that there is an incentive for companies to be collecting this type of data, trading it, selling it. And therefore, when, when there's a market for that data, it also increases the, the impetus to collect more data and in more facets of our lives and in, in more ways because there, there is such a huge market for it. And you know when, when that's the, the state of affairs, it is definitely going to, um, to push those, those tech companies to try to limit the amount of protections that there are on that type of data collection. And to, to the second question, I think that some of the biggest things that, that we can do to combat that are trying to pass data protection legislation like we're going to talk about uh, further, but also just education. I think education is such a huge, huge aspect to this larger issue in the sense that average consumers usually don't tend to, to have a full picture of what's being collected on them, how it's being used, and what the potential consequences of that are. And likewise, neither do many lawmakers who, who are sitting in, in judgment of, of potential policies. And so I think if we can continue to create awareness around what the implications of this sort of data collection and eventual manipulation are, I think we'll get a lot farther towards individuals being able to proactively protect themselves and also being able to pass better legislation. All right. And I'm going to have a follow-up question for you, Brianna. Um, why is data privacy simply not an issue of you know new shiny technology, but rather an issue that should worry democracies, you know, public institutions like banking, online learning, um, an issue that impacts people's constitutional rights, uh, you know, their expectation of privacy, um, and people who have a range of critiques. I mean, 
things from the innocuous, you know, what flavor of ice cream is the best uh, to those who, you know, might express opinions that critique, you know, folks that are, um, you know, people with the most power. Well, I think as Jen already mentioned earlier, you know, we, we've already seen extreme abuses of, of this type of data collection. When, when you have the ability to collect data from certain groups, um, for example, collecting data from Muslim users of prayer and dating apps, you know, one, there's, there's more potential for abuse there because, you know, groups like this are already targeted for various reasons. But then you also need to look at who the data is being sold to and who, who it's being allowed to be shared with, whether that's law enforcement, whether that's ICE, whether that's you know, other government agencies. A specific example that I can think of is you know, if, let's say, information is being shared with the, the US government, DHS, um, about Muslim prayer apps, Many of the CVE, which is Countering Violent Extremism programs that um, have been operational in our country for, for the last decade, they look at, at what they call indicators of extremism that can be extremely, extremely innocuous data points, such as how many hours is someone online per day? How many times does somebody open that prayer app to pray each day? And you know, based on, on things that people would never imagine are being collected or judged or, or having uh, conclusions drawn about them, that information can be used to harm them. And people don't see, they, without being able to create awareness about this, people aren't going to, to think twice about how they're using these types of technologies and usually don't have a sense of where that information is going. So I think for one, we, we need to think about this as a much larger issue than just, you know, Oh, can they collect my cookies? Sure, I don't know what that is. It's fine. I'm sure there's nothing sensitive there. To be thinking about, you know, are are your students' remote learning platforms collecting information about your children? Are, uh, you know, your banking apps noting information about the way that you you spend your money? And where is this information going? How is it going to be used? And I think we just really need to expand the understanding of of how this data can be manipulated. Oh, thank you for that. Um, and I just wanna do a quick time check. Um, I think we've got about four minutes left for this segment. So if it's okay, um, I'd like to um, maybe segue to automated decision systems, which is a bill that you are both familiar with. Um, you know, it's a, there was an ADS work group um, as, as established by the legislature, created some very powerful recommendations to the state legislature. Uh, including a list of guiding principles that the state should do to take into consideration when procuring systems that would otherwise have an effect on people. Um, despite the legislative report that came out um, and that the bills, uh, the bill that advocates created, uh, it didn't seem, um, you know, to overstep, you know, in terms of procedure. But, you know, the advocates will advocate after all, right? There's a there's a process. And what kind of opposition did we get to, um, you know, the bill? And were you surprised? And I don't know, Jen, if, if you want to sort of maybe describe what ADS looks like, um, because that, that can also be a, an issue that people don't really understand much about. Sure. Um, I can start us off by talking um, a bit about what automated decision systems are. I'll talk a little bit about some of the key issues, and I'll pass it over to Brianna, and hopefully we can do it all in the time allotted. Um, so um, every day, people are denied health care. They're Least, kept in jail and passed up for jobs, all because of decisions that have been made or have been aided by automated decision systems. So if you've ever had your application for a mortgage, a credit card, apartment, benefits, or job rejected or denied, you might have asked yourself, how was this decision made? Is there an option for me to challenge or understand that decision? And it's likely that in many of those cases, you weren't actually able to find a clear answer. And this sort of situation when you're wondering if and how a machine made or influenced a decision about your life really illustrates the trouble with algorithms and automated decision systems in use today. And that is that often we don't even know when they are in use. And when we do know, it's difficult, if not impossible, to understand how they work or challenge decisions. Um, so these systems are increasingly affecting our lives, and these systems can often reinforce and perpetuate biases, leading to discriminatory impacts. Um, and 
it's concerning that sometimes agencies themselves can't uh, examine, uh, let alone understand these algorithms. Um, so the bill that, that we try to push forward this year, SB 5116, really um, tries to make these systems that agencies are using transparent to the public. So first of all, we actually know that these systems are being used. Um, and secondly, it, it, it seeks to make these systems accountable to people requiring um, that these systems actually be uh, subject to bias audits and accuracy audits and things like that. Um, and Eric, to your question about mm -hmm. Uh, pushback that we receive from agencies, um, both within and outside of this automated decision work group that Brianna, Eric, and I, and a number of other folks participated in. Um, you know, one of the key concerns that we heard was uh, that the definition of automated decision system was too broad, um, which we sought to address via um, creating a prioritization framework that would help agencies really hone in and figure out the systems that are most likely to cause harm and impact the most amount of people. Um, and then the second point is really related. Um, there were concerns about time and resources. So agencies were really concerned that, you know, there have been decades of automated decision systems that have been acquired by agencies that may not have been subject to error and bias audits, accuracy and bias audits. So um, I think there was a lot of concern about doing this retroactive assessment and kind of the, the, the results that, that such um, an assessment might, uh, might have. So, um, you know, we, we were just like, well, we wanna really help agencies utilize the time and resources they have to um, address those concerns. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's really important, no matter how hard it is, we have to assess the tools that, you know, that government is using for biases and, and errors because they have real serious impacts on our lives. Um, and I'll pass it on to Brianna. I would just add to that that uh, another bit of pushback that we got, particularly working with agency partners during the work group, was that uh, many of the state agencies use tools that are, are built by private companies and that they were concerned that if they need to investigate what is involved in, in the building and functioning of these tools, that we'd run into intellectual property issues and then private companies would not be willing to sell these, these tools to our agencies. And so it became a, a question of, are we going to lose the efficiency and the reasons that, that we implemented these tools in the first place to the fact that it is going to take so much effort and such a fight to be able to investigate them when there really is a, a technology and a neutrality bias, I believe in, in many of these systems where the, the agencies implemented them at least in part to avoid some of the, the individual manual biases that might have existed in, in previous practices, manual decisions, um, but without understanding how the systems that they're using are actually working, they're just assuming that a, a, a computer must be able to function with less bias than an individual. And that's, that's really a huge fallacy because again, just like we spoke about the data collection, these, these tools, are, are built around and trained on the data that's being collected historically. So if you have you know, a system that, that is looking at where police resources should be distributed, a lot of that information is going to, to be trained from historic police data, as we know, is incredibly biased. And so I think fighting the, the belief that these systems are neutral and that you know, we, we do need to push agencies to understand what they're using is a huge part of that battle. Absolutely. Um, and if I can add one more thing, um, um, one small uh, win that we did have with automated decision systems is that this year we did um, uh, manage to include, get included in the budget, $100,000, um, for the Office of the Chief Information Officer to work with state agencies to create an initial inventory of automated decision systems in use. So while this isn't you know, close to what we want in a really robust automated decision system bill, um, by this time next year, we should have 
at least the very preliminary understanding of systems that are, that are in use by agencies, whether those are predictive policing tools, risk assessment tools, benefits distribution algorithms. So um, we're really looking forward to um, seeing what we learn from that. And we hope that, um, you know, we hope our hope is that this uh, budget item is maintained when it gets to the governor's desk and um, he signs it into action. <laughs> And we'll keep pushing for really strong algorithmic accountability legislation um, in the upcoming sessions. Thank you both. You have just done so much good. Um, and I hope that people will recognize it. Um, so yeah, just thank you so much, Brianna and Jen. Um, so please uh, welcome me in joining our last panel, um, Inoka Herat and Katrina Johnson, who are here to discuss issues of police accountability. Um, welcome. Hi, Eric. All right. So the first question is, um, the 2021 legislative session brought about many changes that prioritized uh, impacted family members, please, to reduce police violence and hold officers accountable after they harm people. Uh, limits on no-knock warrants, chokeholds, the use of force, including uh, lethal force on members of the public, were heavily debated and advanced through the legislative process and signed into law. It was truly a historic session. Could you describe what, what these changes meant after generations of harm at the hands of police? Sure, yeah, yes. Last year was a historic session um, in terms of police, uh, police reforms. And that was thanks to the thousands of people who marched across Washington um, to protest against police brutality. And thanks to the family members like Katrina who, um, who really made their voices heard at the legislature to call for change and to call for changes to police culture. And we know that not one bill can change <laughs> policing. And it was amazing to see 12 bills passed last session. Um, you know, and, and some of them were preventative, like a bill on tactics, as you mentioned, that banned chokeholds and um, really limited vehicle pursuits and shooting at moving vehicles and, um, and no-knock warrants, et cetera. There's another preventative bill on the use of force and when officers can use physical force against a member of the public um, that really was uh, transformational in a sense. It, it was, it limited what officers could do um, and especially when they could use deadly force. And we saw a significant change thanks to those kinds of reforms. You know, for the first time in the 22 years that Washington State has collected this data, we saw a 60% decline in police killings in Washington. And it really stood out from across the country. Across the country, this was the highest, 2021 was um, saw the highest number of police killings since the Washington Post had been collecting that data. But in Washington, we saw that decline and that was um, hugely significant. Um, and so it really set up some new parameters and, and you know, the beginnings of police culture change and, um, and that had an impact. And there's also some accountability measures to, um, to hold officers accountable uh, if, harm, if harm did occur. So um, how did law enforcement respond and push back on these new laws? Um, was enforcement, uh, law enforcement justified in the response or interpretation of the new laws? Um, I don't think they really took the time to try to interpret the new law. <laughs> I think that they were just so upset that um, they weren't able to carry on in the manner that they were, that they just decided that a temper tantrum would be the best way to go. And what that means is they just or their job is to protect and serve. And they decided they weren't gonna um, answer crisis calls um, because they just didn't want to, not because they couldn't, because there wasn't anything in the law that restricted them um, from doing their job. Um, and with that, then they went out on this fear campaign, um, you know, promoting fear within the community. Um, and I think that a lot of that is why we were in such this fight mode, this legislative session, uh, I think there was a lot of community members that didn't really understand um, that they could still do their job. There wasn't anything that was preventing them from doing that. And now that the law may end up being changed, guess what? It still isn't going to stop your car from being stolen because the reality of the situation is 
um, the data doesn't shows that crime is actually down. It may not look like that in every neighborhood, but that's what the data shows. Um, we can't go on hypothetical things, and that's what law enforcement um, was bringing to the table during uh, talks and negotiations. What if this happens? Well, what happens if it doesn't happen? So that's kind of what we were dealing with, um, just the unwillingness to come to the table in a meaningful way. Thank you so much, Katrina. Um, what were the expectations going into the session in terms of, um, you know, clarifying legislative intent? Um, what was the coalition stance engagement on these proposals? Um, and were there any that did not meet the spirit for uh, which they were being described as cleanup, but instead, uh, you know, signaled significant uh, significant departure or rollback uh, from the legislation that was advanced in 2021? Yeah, there were a couple bills that were clarifying, and so they kept the same intent and, and um, policies of the reforms that were passed, but they made certain tweaks for to sort of account for unintended consequences. For example, um, there was the tactics bill banned certain military equipment, and it was based on caliber of, of bullets, but it turns out that less lethal uh, weapons uh, like Nerf sort of foam bullets, et cetera, have had the same caliber as the things that were banned. So there were bills to sort of clarify that, of course, the legislature did not mean to ban less lethal alternatives. Um, you know, and so th there, were, th there were two bills that that did end up clarifying and the coalition and the ACLU Washington were supportive of those. Um, but then there were other bills that really sought to roll back the policy and um, we were really opposed to those and fought really hard. And so one um, was SB 5919, which sought to expand when officers can engage in vehicle pursuits, which are inherently dangerous. And um, what we saw during, you know, after these new laws went into effect was that the, you know, after shooting, vehicle pursuits are the second most deadly <laughs> way um, that results in police killing. And um, we saw that number decline in half. And so, um, you know, the, the policy was really working and thankfully that did not pass. But there was a rollback bill, HB 2037, that would allow officers to use force against someone who flees from an investigatory stop that did pass. And we do see that as a rollback and we worked really hard to fight and oppose that and to narrow it as much as possible. Um, you know, these kinds of investigatory stops, officers don't have very much evidence uh, connecting someone to wrongdoing. These are also known as Terry stops or sort of stop and frisk. Uh, people might've heard that before. And to authorize officers to use force on that is really concerning to people's civil liberties. And we know that that's gonna harm young people, black and brown people, and, um, and those with developmental disabilities and others. And so we were really concerned about that and pushing back really hard on that. No, and thank you for all your work on this, uh, Katrina and Inoka. And also just want to uh, give props to my colleague, uh, Roxana Gomez, who, you know, is our second lobbyist and, you know, heard a lot of stories about, you know, the back and forth on so many of these bills that I will not share here, but, you know, um, we're, we're very much glad that 5919 did not go to the governor's desk. Um, however, 2037, which you mentioned, uh, contains a provision, uh, Section 3, uh, not supported by the Washington Coalition for Police Accountability. It advanced with ample support from both Republicans and Democrats, um, and it is expected to be signed by Governor Inslee uh, without any changes, uh, as far as we know. Uh, WCPA has sent the governor a letter urging for his veto of Section 3. Um, if he does not veto, what does that signal to the families, the voters who march for police accountability, and what does it mean for the, uh, in terms of broader public safety? Um, what it means is all the hard work, some of the hard work we did last year is completely rolled back. And the things that made us safer this year that caused us to have a decline in police use of deadly force will go away because now they, you know, can do whatever they want on a hunch, um, you know, reasonable suspicion. And there's if someone has headphones on and is walking down the street and they look like someone and the officer is trying to get their attention, but he doesn't hear them, then he can go and tackle them or cause them great harm. And they don't even know that they were being talked to. Like it's, it, it just opens the door for 
black and brown and indigenous people who are already over police to have more harm done upon them in community. And if the governor doesn't have the political will to do what is right after wanting to implement all these changes and do, um, you know, uh, a task force for, um, you know, police not investigating themselves and things like that, this isn't helping because you're opening up that door to more uses of force to happen and deadly force by signing this bill into law. And shame on you for everyone having the political will um, with what happened with George Floyd, but this year having none because it's an election year. Thank you, Katrina. Um, what are some of the remaining articles of legislation uh, that could reduce police violence and uh, hold law enforcement accountable uh, when they violate people's rights? Um, and what can the public do uh, about these bills um, you know, to ensure that they advance in the legislative arena next year? Yeah, even after last year's um, historic wins on this, we weren't done. I mean, there's still so much more <laughs> to do. On the preventative side, um, you know, we really wanna address traffic stops. Traffic stops are the number one way that officers interact with members of the public, and it exposes both people and officers to uh, to danger and to using force, especially on really low level um, offenses such as expired tabs or having a taillight out or hanging something from your rear view mirror. And so we've seen harm come from those, and so we are. Uh, it's really important and critical to us to limit that. Um, we also want to look at accountability. You know, when we think about holding an officer accountable for using excessive force or for harming someone, um, you know, one of the ways we can hold them accountable is at the department level. You know, that's officer discipline. So, um, subjecting an officer who has harmed a member of the public to being fired or being suspended, and so working on officer discipline is is definitely a priority, um, as well as um, civil liability. So, being able to sue an officer department. And that's really about justice for families, you know, justice for victims of police violence, you know, to be able to um, pay their medical bills and to be able to, uh, you know, to do what they need to do in order to, to heal and, and recover from the harm of losing someone or, or being harmed by police violence. Um, and then there's also, you know, a bill around, um, criminal in the criminal you know sphere holding an officer accountable by charging them criminally the last year we passed something on independent investigations and next year a priority for the coalition is to be able to have independent prosecutions because local prosecutors are so tied to working with law enforcement that um you know it, it almost seems like a natural conflict of interest it's very difficult to hold officers accountable that way currently so changes to that i think would be critical as well Wow. Well, thank you so much for your work, uh, Inoka and Katrina, and thank you for your presentation. And um, just, it's, I'm in awe, I'm speechless. Um, so let's go ahead and bring back the entire group. Uh, we've got about seven minutes for questions. Um, went a little bit over, but hopefully we'll be able to, you know, maybe get two or three in. Okay, um, Linda Hood is asking, do you support police having to carry insurance, which could be revoked if they have incidents anal analogous to medical malpractice insurance? You know, in Washington, um, actually the, the vast majority of officers are indemnified as, as local or state employees. And so um, it really falls on departments to to sort of foot the bill, um, and so one of the one of the uh, priorities within the civil liability bill is to incentivize departments to have good policies, to have good training, um, to to discipline officers, and to get <laughs> officers who've caused harm off the force, et cetera, um, because it really falls on a department um, when an officer does harm a member of the public. Um, there are some states that have taken an approach to hold officers individually uh, liable, um, but those haven't actually gone 
so far, I mean, it's, maybe it's too early to tell, but in the past uh, year or two that those laws have been in effect, we haven't seen it make a significant difference yet, um, but still to be, to be seen on that front. Awesome, thank you. Um, we've got one question um, from Melvin. Um, do you think it's possible to remove bias in automated decision-making that makes it less biased than face-to-face -face data collection? Um, I can uh, answer that. Um, and Brianna, please feel free to add. Um, I think you know automated decision systems often simply perpetuate existing biases and harms in our society. But because of the phenomenon known as automation bias, they're more trusted and seen as more accurate, objective, and scientific, um, when that actually may not be the case. They may often be more inaccurate than face-to-face um, than, uh, -face or human um, decision systems. Um, and for certain systems, I think it, is, it may be possible to improve accuracy and biases, but ultimately because these systems rely on historically biased data, or I should say they often rely on historically biased data, and because they will ultimately operate in the context of our very inequitable society, um, it's, I think there's a high chance that these systems, if they're not really scrutinized um, and there aren't adequate checks um, and there isn't transparency, I think these systems have a huge potential to cause um, even more harm than um, human decision systems, um, which is why we're pushing forward um, algorithmic accountability legislation. I would agree with Jen completely. And I would just say that I think even if we did have completely unbiased data that was going in on the front end of these systems, that there should still be an element of discretion and oversight. And that in order for any of these systems to, to operate truly unbiasedly, that that would still have to be a strong element. Thank you so much. All right, we're gonna take one more question before we close out. And the question is from Susan. What is next for COCA, the Keep Our Care Act? Thanks for asking that, Susan. Um, you know, I wish I had a crystal ball and I could say, you know, we're definitely passing Keep Our Care Act next session. And um, what I can tell you is, I think we have such a strong and ded dedicated and talented coalition that is determined to keep on moving this bill forward until it passes. And I'm really excited to continue with educating both the public and lawmakers and advocating to make this law in the near future. Couldn't say it better, Leah. All right, um, so we're gonna close out and I just wanna say thank you so much to our panelists, uh, Katrina Johnson, Brianna Frey, Yvette Magagna, our staff at the ACLU, Leah Rutman, uh, Inoka Harat, Jen Lee, um, there's a pattern here. I don't know if folks have picked that up, but these are incredibly talented, brilliant minds uh, that we get to work with every day. So um, I just want to say thank you for your tireless work, for your passion, and just the amount of energy that you all spend on making sure that we are able to live in a better Washington. So I want to say thank you to that. And thank you for everyone uh, for continuing to uh, tune in regularly uh, to our flights and rights. And uh, please do visit Boots Bakery um, in Spokane uh, and then Bell Breaker and Yonder Cider Tap Room if you're able to. But, uh, with that said, I want to say thank you and uh, good night.